Welcome to the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. My name is Pat Healy, and I usually say I'm your host, Pat Healy, and I guess technically I am still your host. I belong to you forever and always. But I am turning over the interviewing duties to Talia Smith, a writer for Berkeley Online. So you'll take note of Talia doing all the questioning and take note of our special guest, Camila Marshall. Camila has a 30-year career in the music industry, beginning in musical theater, branching out to touring companies, and eventually to Broadway, landing roles in Rent, The Lion King, and Hairspray. She has toured as a backup singer with Bette Midler and with Taylor Swift, the latter which Camila politely requested we not ask about since Taylor is her current boss. I mean, would you go on a podcast and talk about your current boss? Makes sense. Camila has also recorded an album under her own name, and she says she hopes to record another one soon. Last year, she released a potent single with Forrest Black called Both Sides. Check it out. So before I let you in on Talia and Camila's conversation, I'll share this with you. Camila is also a Berkeley Online student. Talia happened to be taking a creative writing course with her, and she mentioned this to me. So since the two already knew each other from class, I figured Talia should be the one to talk with her. Also worth noting, Talia is a big fan of Taylor Swift and a self-avowed musical theater nerd. So, makes sense. Camila's musical journey began as most do, with her parents. Let's let her tell you all about it. My parents were the types that were always playing music, and it was everything from Aretha Franklin to Jimi Hendrix, um, both influences to this day. So I had, you know, my mom, who was more of the soul influence, Motown, girl groups, you know, uh, the Patti LaBelles, the Aretha Franklins, and I had my dad, who was big on more of the jazz scene, Miles Coltrane, all of that. Um, so I think I was probably subconsciously taking it in at a very young age. I felt like I gravitated to performing and singing, um, but I was extremely shy. I was like the shyest kid. So, you know, I was always put in talent shows and then always crying on stage because people were staring at me and I didn't know how to get through it. But I always say I kept wanting to go back, which is how I knew I had no other choice but to do it. It wasn't an option. Like, even though I was terrified, it was like, okay, how do I get through this? So I would say that was probably like seven or eight. And then it just kind of propelled from there. I remember when I was in 11, I was in a like a community theater production of a show and I had a part and I had a I was playing young Lena Horn and I had a solo and I wasn't the best singer and the director let me know that I wasn't the best singer and that was a very traumatizing event for me and I think after that was when it really started because that rejection and those very harsh words to um, that 11-year-old little girl propelled me and and just kind of put a fire in me to want to get past that and want to be better and want to prove him wrong and prove it to myself. So that's kind of all when it started. That's awesome because I feel like it could have gone either way for an 11-year-old. You could have said, yeah. okay, that was harsh. I think I'm done here. Yeah, it's such a pivotal moment, you know, for for a child. Again, I think it goes back to there was always something in me going, no, I'm going to keep going. No, I'm going to mm-hmm. keep walking. So I, I found myself at a performing arts high school, and it was just like I kind of kept going and going and going. And even though that insecurity was kind of hanging over my shoulder the entire time, something in me was like, yeah, but, you know, yes, and I'm moving on. <laughs> so you went to Orange County School for the Arts, right? I did. This is going to be fun. You're going to know all these fun facts about me that I'm going to be like, how do you know that? I know. I hope it's not <laughs> creepy. <laughs> I can't wait. Um. So yeah, you, you grew up in Long Beach, right? Yeah. In Orange County. It is kind of like on the cusp, Orange County, Long Beach. So mm-hmm. I was in kind of both places and the school was on the cusp of, of Long Beach. So okay. those are all my own stomping ground. And can you talk a bit about like sort of what your education was like and how it kind of propelled you into Broadway? 
Sure. So that school had been around for a couple of years before I got there, and it was on the campus of Los Alamitos High School, which was a regular school. So it wasn't like a conservatory where all day we were just, you know, singing and dancing kind of thing. We had a football team and a basketball team, and it was all regular school life as well. And the arts program was after school. That was when it just became like I knew, you know, I was, I feel like I was with my people. It was like, I found my people. We're all musical theater nerds. And we all, you know, <laughs> love that. And at the time, I think I was kind of at a crossroads of wanting to be in theater, wanting to be on Broadway, and wanting to be on TV. I wasn't kind of in, I want to be a pop star or make records just yet. I ended up going through that in the plays, you know, and all the musicals and all the performing groups and the show choir and, and everything. And I graduated six months early. I just kind of crammed all of my senior year credits into one semester because I felt like, what if I get an opportunity to leave early? I want to be ready. I want to be graduated, you know, and I did end up leaving early. What would you say is like your highlight performance from your time there? Yeah, I was the witch in Into the Woods. Everybody's welcome if you catch that footage. Um, <laughs> and I was Anita and West Side Story. And those were definitely the highlights of my time there. Again, if you're going back to that time and carrying that insecurity to get those kind of roles, you know, to get those lead roles was such a big deal for me. So, um, you know, I was just trying to not kind of shy away for it, to step into it and own it. But again, I was still really kind of figuring it all out at the time. But, you know, I'm still friends with so many of those people. I always say I don't, if I could go back to high school tomorrow, I would. I just, uh, it was really really great time and really started to shape what I wanted to do for a living, you know, and where I started figuring out, like, there's nothing else I want to do. Anita being one of your favorite roles, I mean, that's such a hard role and an emotionally tolling role to do at that age. You know, in high school, you play adult roles, you know, you play roles bigger than what what you know at that, you know, what you've experienced at that age. So, you know, we did the best we could. So how did you make the jump to Broadway? So I did some tours, regional theater stuff for a while, and then Rent happened, and they were auditioning in L.A., which was kind of unheard of because they didn't come to L.A a lot for things, uh, but they were looking for all the right people for the tour, for the first national tour. So I got a call. It was like a private audition. I got a call to come in for that. And to cut it short, I auditioned for Rent 10 times, wow. well, nine times. Um, I just kind of kept going back and forth and back and forth and doing the same material and different material. I ended up in New York City for the first of the final callbacks. I saw the show. I fell in love. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, my God, I have to do this. But the idea of being on Broadway was so grand to me then, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so, like, it couldn't happen for me this soon. I didn't get it at the time. Went away. And I auditioned a few more times before I just got a phone call saying, come be a swing and rent. And so I was a swing on the first national tour. If you know what, it, for people who don't know what a swing is, it's a person who covers multiple roles. So I basically covered Mimi, Joanne, the Seasons of Love soloist, Alexi Darling, Mark's mom. And then six months later, I got promoted and I was Joanne on the tour. Wow. And that led me, I did that for two years um, time of my life. And then when we were done with that, the first national tour closed down, I got a call to say, come to Broadway. So that was my first Broadway show. And it was a dream. Wow. A dream come true. Were you Joanne on Broadway? I was not. I went in as a swing and I was there for a while, almost nine months. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it had kind of added, my time with Rent had added up to be about three years. Yeah. And so I was ready to leave. And as soon as I was ready to leave, they were like, we were about to ask you to be Joanne. And I'm like, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah. On to the next thing. Yeah. I just left New York. I had played the role so many times on Broadway then, just kind of going on for anybody who, who was not there, you know. And I felt like, you know, I've done it. I have the credit. I've been on Broadway. I've done rent and I need to kind of go back to California and get my bearings and reset. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Did The Lion King come next or was Hairspray next? You're so good. <laughs> uh, it was Lion King. Okay, cool. And how did yeah. that all come about? I want to say I just auditioned 
I have these fun audition stories, and anybody who's in the Broadway scene will agree that when you have your best auditions and you think you nailed it, it's always when they never call. (laughs) And (laughs) when you're uh, audition is a bit of a dumpster fire. They're like, we love you. And so uh, that's kind of what happened with me uh, with Lion King. I didn't do a great job. And I thought, I'm never getting this. And somehow I did. And that ended up being, it was a toss up between the Broadway production and the LA production was there. And I was really praying to get in the LA production because I had just gotten home from rent and I just kind of wanted to stay in California a bit. New York City was a lot for me (laughs) to live in New York City for my first time. So I was really hoping that I'd get the Pantages company and I did. And I was there for nine months. It was really, really cool, really challenging with learning the uh, South African language and learning to sing in that style. Um, yeah. The costumes and the way right. they work and the way we had to move our body. It was very heavy, very taxing, but really, really exciting. That's musical theater history. I consider that to be part of musical theater history. So, Yeah. The Lion King was the first musical I ever saw on Broadway at age six. And Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I just remember it like as a kid, the costumes just being so intricate and like being so familiar with the movie. It was just like amazing. Can you remember the first time that you were sitting there and the animals were like coming down the aisle? I just remember seeing it and sobbing going, I have to be in. This is the most beautiful thing. Yeah, no, I just got goosebumps even thinking about that. It's like you just unlocked a memory that I hadn't thought about in a long, long time. (laughs) It's like nothing you've ever seen, and you're like, oh my gosh, they look like real animals, and they're all singing, and they just keep coming. Like, it was just so magical. Yeah. What were the different roles that you did in The Lion King? What did I do? I was a blade of grass. Ooh. <laughs> One time I played a leaf on a tree in a musical. Did you? Yes. So you, so you feel me. In Once on This Island. <laughs> I was in Once on This Island, too. Oh, cool. Um, No, I think I was just a lioness. I was in the ensemble, and I understudied some roles. And they actually, which is a testament to, I guess, how much I learned the language, I understudied a lot of the South Africans. They're like the best singers in the world. So that was like a compliment. Yeah. (laughs) What was it like kind of like moving in these sort of costumes? You know, you ask any of us, and we'll all say it was really, really hard. Yeah. I can't badmouth it because the thing that I loved about it so much was the costumes, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. It just started to break us down. You know, you have to be in such great physical shape to carry some of that because Mm -hmm. a lot of it is like really heavy stuff on your head and you have to move your head back and forth. So, you know, in you just so then you're watching your neck and you have to watch your knees. And that was the toughest part of it all was figuring out how to save your body while giving your full self to it. It definitely was a a learning lesson. And so many people got hurt. So many people to this day are still injured from it, sadly. But um, yeah, it's it's really unfortunate. But like the music's so great and the colors are so great and it looks so amazing and the story's so awesome and so um, nostalgic for so many people. So I do, I do love it, but that was definitely a difficult challenge. Yeah. Um, did you personally ever get hurt? I did, but I want to say that hairspray showed up in the nick of time. Okay. <laughs> not have it be so bad. Okay. Um, well, hairspray is exciting because you were in the original cast, right? I was. That's so cool. So did that come along um, shortly after The Lion King? Yeah, it overlapped. So when I was in Rent, I was doing what they call readings. So it's just kind of little short, little stents of musicals, um, not full-blown productions. You're literally just kind of crafting the show. And so I did a reading during Hairspray, and I think over the time—I mean— Sorry, reading of Hairspray during Rent. And I think over the course of two years, we did four readings. So I was kind of going back and forth to California. I think I did two while I was in Rent, went away, and then flew in to do these readings. And after the fourth one, they said it was going to be a musical. And that was literally almost an overlap with Lion King. Like, I I think I might have left Lion King because Hairspray was happening. I'm noticing that there's like a theme with all the shows, the big shows that you've done, is they all kind of 
have very big messages. Like Rent talks about the AIDS epidemic and hairspray segregation. And Iron King is, you know, a celebration of African culture. And it introduces kids to concepts like death and becoming a, a responsible leader. So when you were in these shows, what was it like stepping into these different roles? And how did you get in the mindset to convey these big subjects? This is an amazing question. So I guess I would say Rent being the first of such a gigantic message. I mean, everything that came with Rent from the message to Jonathan Larson passing away to, you know, everything that kind of comes along with that is so big and so powerful. And we really did our best to live that, you know, live no day but today and live everyone being themselves and accepting everyone. And to this day, so many of the Rent cast are family to me. Uh, which kind of proves that we we really took that message in. It's emotional. It's emotional at all times. You know, when you get in these shows, you have a job to do. And so I, I think it helped that we were all in the same headspace and we were all prepared to do that job and deliver that message every night. But every show was different. You know, Lion King... They're they're all just kind of a celebration of life in their own way. Really, all of these shows. We were living that. You know, when you're young and you're on Broadway and you're in these hit shows, you just feel on top of the world. And we were celebrating our life in the moment, going on stage, celebrating the life of these characters and this music. And so it wasn't really hard. You know, it was easy. I knew people who had passed away from AIDS at the time when I was doing Rent. Um, so a lot of that became very real to me, you know, and Hairspray with the concept of, the, you know, the themes of racism and, and all of that. I've experienced that. So that wasn't very hard. So I just happened to fall in these shows that where the theme was really close to home at, at some points, you know. So sort of to that point, of, you know, living it every day, performing for Broadway is so grueling and taxing. You would do as many as like eight shows a week, right? Yeah. 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 That's One day off. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you do at that time to sort of take care of yourself and make sure that you can get on stage feeling your best every day? You know, there is a fine balance that I don't know that I've ever mastered <laughs> because it's your one day off where you kind of need to rest and recoup and reset for that next week, but it's also your one day off and you're like, I also want to have a life. You know, you just kind of, it was trial and error, you know, too much <laughs> drinking. Okay. No, not to do that next week, you know, but sometimes it was like, it's our only day and we'd leave on Sunday to do a little out of town vacation and come back in on Tuesday afternoon and then start those shows. I remember one time me and a friend wanted to go shopping in Chicago and we were like, do we do it? And we just hopped on the plane for the day to go shopping yes. in Chicago <laughs> and came back, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, as taxing as that seems, it was fun and refreshing to do. So you kind of came back renewed for the week in that way. But yeah, um, yeah you have to, you have to eat, right? You have to stretch, you have to uh, work out. Only the partying side lasts for so long mm -hmm. before you start feeling it in show number four. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I bet your body just gets used to it after a while and kind of like that's your baseline, right? Yeah, it does. Somehow it's just like you do it, it even if you didn't have sleep or you didn't really get a day off because sometimes some of us would be doing readings by day and we wouldn't have a day off. And so it just kind of readings by day, the show by night. I mean, anything could happen. A lot of people started writing their own music and performing in their own shows. So they'd gig on their Monday night, their only night off. So it just depends on, depended on where you were at the time, but I made it through. And then when I didn't have to do eight shows a week anymore, I was really grateful. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. Because of the pandemic, you know, Broadway shut down and it's very sad. Mm. Uh, do you mm -hmm. know people that are affected by that? Yeah. 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 I mean, I still consider myself a part of the Broadway community, yeah. even though I haven't been there in a while. And um, a lot of my friends, super effective. A lot of people moved out of the city. And uh, I would say the greatest thing is, I guess, everybody's figuring out this other version of them because we were all working and it was just go, go, go. That's the life we knew. That's what we thought. That's all we thought we did. 
And now we're realizing that we're so much more Mm -hmm. than that. So people are taking up painting and, you know, making sweatshirts and photography and, you know, cooking classes and, you know, starting side businesses and coaching. So I've, it's been really cool to see so many of my friends kind of find this other life, you know, this second life that they didn't even know existed. Okay. So here's where my deep dive of your Twitter is going to show. Okay. Oh, of my Twitter. Jeez. (laughs) I saw that you're friends with Leslie Odom Jr. So I was just wondering how you two met and if you saw one night in Miami and what you thought of it. Yes. Oh, Leslie. I met Leslie. He did a reading of Hairspray. He was seaweed. Oh, And uh, he was at Carnegie Mellon at the time. And I remember he he came in and he, he was the most talented. And I was like, dude, this kid is crazy, crazy talented. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I met him. And then it was just probably he didn't end up doing hairspray with us uh when it when it went. But you know, then you just kind of run into each other later in the city. And, you know, I'm trying to think, did I ever work with him again or if it was all just fun and games after that? Oh, yes. Yes, I did. I've worked with him a couple of times, but he's a doll, and I think he's great. I also worked with his wife. We did a a, a show called Post Office. God bless that show. <laughs> um, and we were both in that together. They weren't married at the time. Okay. But um, they were dating. And so, yeah, I, I've known them for a very, very long time. I saw one night in Miami. Yeah. I think he's fantastic. I, so I don't too. think there's much that he does that he's not great at. So there's that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he was a brilliant Sam Cook. Brill. Brill. Yeah, and I and what I loved about it is that I always know he does the work. He's he's doing a deep dive to be the best version of that character, you know, that his his person can offer offer. So, I was really just I'm always excited to see where his where he's going to go in any given production. And Leslie, actually, I remind him of this often. He gave me one of the best pieces of advice I've ever received. Ooh. And I think we were in a show. We were singing Beatles music. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I might have said something about not being able to sing this or hit this note or I don't, I don't do it like that. I don't sing like that. And he basically said, find out what you do and do that well. And then you don't have to apologize for all the other stuff that you don't do, you know. And he gave me an instance and he was like, you know, at the time he said, I don't sing above a whisper. So, you know, if you're Mm -hmm. hiring me and you want a bigger sound, you got to shove a microphone down my throat because I'm not going (laughs) to sing above a whisper. He's like, find what you do well, stand in that. And, you know, and own that. And I remember at the time that was just like the greatest advice. And it comes up for me a lot. You know, there's times where I'll text him and just kind of remind him, like, remember when you told me this? Thank you. (laughs) Still, still stands. It's something that wouldn't have occurred to me, but makes so much sense for him, especially because his most powerful moments in Hamilton, I feel like, are just whispers, these very quiet moments. Yeah. Well, and then I saw him in Hamilton and I thought, well, we've got out of that whisper because he started, you know, he belts and he can sing anything. And it's, you know, but at the time, I just, it was a really powerful piece of advice that I kind of give on to other people because I'm like, you know what you do, you know what you're great at and know what you're not great at. And you don't have to apologize. You can just be like, if you want me, this is what I do. And I do this well. If If you want something else, that's not me. And let's move on to you know, someone else. So yeah, um, yeah, I hold that dear to this day. And what did you realize is something that you do best? In life, I encourage. I always say if encouragement was a spiritual gift, that is, I mean, I do it even when I go, I'm not going to do it. And I find myself doing it. So <laughs> I know it's just kind of in me to do that and inspire and encourage. Yeah. Um, in song, I don't know. Like, you hire me for tone. You hire me because I can belt. You don't hire me if you want a a riffer like Beyonce. (laughs) You can go ahead and take a hard pass because it it doesn't live here. You know, in songwriting, you hire me because of lyrics. You hire me when you want a good bridge because I'm, I'm, for some reason, I'm gifted in the bridge department. (laughs) Love it. 
So, yeah. And I'm always learning and trying to get better so that I don't have to limit myself, you know? Yeah. So another person who you worked with with uh, Hairspray was Matthew Morrison. Um, Yes. (laughs) So he was the first link on Broadway. Can you talk about like how you've worked with each other in other capacities since the show? Yes. Matthew, Matty Fresh, as I <laughs> like to call him, uh, was a student of mine. Oh. Actually. Wow. Um, he went to OSHA. Okay. And he went to OSHA after me. So I was kind of teaching as he was doing high school. And he was in um, a f- couple of my dance classes. So that's wow. when I first met Matt. So we have like a gigantic past and then cut to. We start Hairspray. He gets cast. He wasn't in the reading, so he shows up in the first day of rehearsal. It's like, oh, my God, you know, I'm in the show with one of my students. This is crazy. (laughs) And he was in the ensemble. Cut to the link at the time, got a movie. He quit. And then Maddie Fresh comes in. He gets Link. And then all of a sudden, my student is now one of the leads in the (laughs) show that I'm doing. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I've known Matt since he was a babe in the woods. Um, He's so dear, so wonderful, so hardworking. Um, As a matter of fact, after I finished with Bette Midler, he was about to do a – he got a record deal. And he was Mm -hmm. on label, and he was going to do like a little mini tour. And he just called me and said, hey, I I don't know what you're doing, but do you want to sing backup for me? Uh, I want to go with people I know and and surround myself with people I love. And I said, yes. And that summer – well, we did some a lot of one-offs, but we ended up going on tour and being the opening act for Backstreet Boys' New Kids on the Block, which wow. was like the craziest, most fun summer of my life. Yeah, he's just so dear to me. I love him so much, so talented, so awesome. That's cool. It must have been so fun to see him on Glee and his career sort of take off into the very oh. mainstream. I mean, yeah, it was really, really emotional. Uh, you know, there are people that you no, which you're probably going to tell me who I know because now I now I know what you're up to, Talia. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. But, the, you know, that with Matt, I just, I knew him when he was, you know, in high school. So to see that kind of growth and to see him in his light and shining like that was, it was just phenomenal. Um, so you mentioned Bette Midler before and mm-hmm. you've worked with her extensively. Yeah. Can you talk about yeah. working with Bette and what that was like? I mean, it was a master class every single day of my life. (laughs) Every single time I was in the room with her, it's just a complete master class in performance, in business, in storytelling. I think that my biggest takeaway from her was storytelling. Mm -hmm. I think that's when I, I realized what I do best, storytell. Everybody can't do everything like we were talking about. That's what I do. I'm a storyteller. And I I guess at the time I didn't know that that was something you could really lead with, you know, and watching her do a song, man, nothing like it, nothing like it. She is the greatest at what she does. So I think it was just all a learning experience. Of course, she's fun. She's challenging. She holds you to a high expectation because she holds herself to a high expectation. You know, there aren't a lot of women who can say they're harlots. It's a very small group of women from when that started to um, this day. So, you know, I always thought it was an honor and I always thought I had to kind of stand up to what the Harlette name was and to be behind such a legend mm-hmm. and an icon. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I really had to pull up. So yeah, it was really, really such a, I think it was about seven years okay, wow. uh, all together because the Kiss My Brass tour was kind of a long time. And then um, Vegas was like two and a half years and, you know, we had breaks and whatever, but yeah, some of my greatest lessons learned were, were with Bet. So here's a connection and I don't know if it's an actual connection, but um, I feel really basic, but I know Bet from Hocus Pocus the most. Absolutely. <laughs> and so, and I know you did um, Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered for Sex in the City too. You know, yes. Sarah Jessica Parker, who is in both. Did that come about? Is there a connection there at all? No, but now that you're saying it, I'm like, kind of, but not really at all. Okay. So I wouldn't have put it together, but I'm like, yes, but no. So Sex in the City happened. We were in Vegas 
Oh my gosh, this is so great. This story is so great. It keeps getting better. Did okay. you see my did you see my wheels turn yes. right there? I would just went. They're spinning. So we were in Vegas doing the residency. Me, Shayna Steele, who now goes to Berkeley with me, and Jordan Ballard, oh. who now goes to Berkeley oh with my me. Gosh. So that's crazy. So we were all in Vegas. We were doing the shows. We got a call for an audition for Sex in the City. It was to be singers at a wedding. We auditioned together as a trio because I think it was supposed to be like a girl group or a, a group. And we were just like, let's just put ourselves on tape together. So we did. And we booked it and we were like, oh my gosh, what is, what are the odds that the three of us here and we booked it and oh my God. And we went to LA to do the soundtrack. We came back to Vegas. Then they said, you're going to tape in New York on whatever day. And it happened to fall on the one or two days off that we had from the bat gig. So we all flew out, did it. Crazy story. We waited. We got dressed. We did hair and makeup. We went to catering. Back to our trailers. Waited. Back to catering. We never went on. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning. They called us down. We're looking at Sarah Jessica and all the people and all the girls and everybody's staring at us. And they say, we're so sorry. We're not going to get to your scene. No. And we're like, Ugh. <laughs> like, you know, but you did a great job on the soundtrack and we're going to, you know, let you have the soundtrack, blah, 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 blah. So we went back defeated. Bet was like, how did it go? We were like, we didn't get to do it. They were still filming the other scene. It took too long. And she's like, oh, I'm so sorry about that. I'm so sorry. So we go on to do Vegas. Cut to Wednesday night of her show. We're getting ready for Vegas. And we get a phone call that says, we're ready for your scene. Can you guys come back tomorrow? Oh, my gosh. The next day, we have one day off, and we're like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Like, we can't get ready for the show. We're like, oh, my God, the whole show, we're like dancing and like singing, looking at each other going, we're going back, we're going back. So we get on a red eye, we finish the show, go home, pack, get on a red eye, get off, go to set. The same thing happens. Hair no. and makeup, ready, catering, back to trailer. It becomes 2 o'clock in the morning this time. We have to go back because we have a show the next day. And all of a sudden at 2 a.m. they come, knock, 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 ladies, it's time. We're like, oh, my God, it's happening. We go down. We shoot the whole thing. Everybody remembers us from the girls who didn't get to do it before. So everybody's, like, smiling and, like, oh, my God. We go home. We're like, bet we did it. She's so happy for us. Oh, my gosh, yay. Cut to the soundtrack comes out. And we're like, wee. Cut to they cut us from the movie. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so... All of that is, makes for a really fun story, but yeah. we got cut from the movie. Oh my gosh, I have secondhand stress just hearing that. I mean, it's the nuttiest story ever, but those are my girls and we're all going to Berkeley now, so who yeah, cares? right. <laughs> so do you feel like in your courses right now that you're able to lend your 30 years of experience to your peers? Yeah, I well, most people, if I'm being honest, like, I hesitated doing this podcast because I just like everything for me in this moment at Berkeley is super humbling. And I think like, whereas when I started, there was so much of me that thought this is going to be great because I already have this foundation of all this stuff. You know, my I remember Mark is is my advisor, Mark Hopkins. Mm, yeah. The first question he said is like, ah. Uh, you know, we had a, a common friend intro, and he's like, I was reading everything that Annie said about you, and I'm just like, why would you want to come here? He's like, everybody who comes here wants to leave here and do like a third of what you've done, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, because I still have so much to learn, and I think there's so much with being in the business and getting experience, but... I never properly learned how to negotiate a contract because I had an agent and I, you know, sometimes had a manager who did it all for me, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's like I know about negotiating a contract, but I don't know the ins and outs of do, I, you know. So I feel like I know how to learn music by ear, but I don't know how to sight read. I don't really know the ins and outs and details of theory. There's so much to learn. So I think a lot of it I had to, once I was really in it, had to strip a lot of it down and kind of walk into Berkeley saying, okay, you actually know nothing. <laughs> you know, let's humble ourselves and let's let's learn it. Let's let's get to the foundation of what this is because I think trying to take my way that I've kind of gotten through my career with, with learning the foundation started to make it more frustrating, mm -hmm. you know? So it's kind of like, break everything down. Let's be humble. 
and let's just come to the table and and really learn this like we're learning it for the first time. So yeah, I don't, you know, I don't feel any way. I'm fascinated by everybody that I'm in the class with. And I think a lot of me is always like, I kind of don't want people to know, you know, I yeah. always get a little nervous when I'm when, you know, that because I Google people all the time. I mean, I go to Instagram and, mm-hmm. you know, look at people all the time and say, oh, this person's, I mean, who's this? And, I, it, you know, I'm always like, please don't go to my Instagram. Please, yeah. please don't see it, you know. Um, and there's so many people at Berkeley who know so much more than I do. I mean, I was in that production class, that logic class, and I was like, God bless me right now because I don't know anything I think the writing classes are where I most feel comfortable. I'm taking another one right now, and I think that that I most feel comfortable there. But even in our creative writing class, it, it got really challenging to hard. where I was kind of showing up going, I really thought I was actually kind of good, but I'm second guessing it. <laughs> yeah, same. Well, yeah, because I write for a living for Berkeley Online. I was like, oh, this will just be like, you know, let me access my creative side. It was really, really hard. And we had stuff to do yeah. every day. But I feel like I came out of it a lot better. Yeah. I And I find myself now, and I'm in the lyric writing class, and I find myself now pulling from that class. And I'm like, thanks, Mark. Yeah. I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's, it's a little late, but... I get how I'm using that. Okay. It's really, really cool. And like ear training right now is so awesome, but like so hard. Mm -hmm. I've used my ear to learn music my entire life and not known it. But when you have to use solfege and sight read and transcribe and really hear if it's a quarter note or a dotted quarter or is there a rest on the end of like all of Mm -hmm. that is like my head is exploding. Yeah. So you're an interdisciplinary studies major, which is basically you create your own major. So what components are you sort of incorporating into your major? Besides all the half, what I call the half twos, which is like, you know, we have to take three business, we have to take three production. I think what I most want out of it, like I'm happy to learn everything, but I think probably music and songwriting. Mm -hmm is what I'm leaning, like those will most likely be all of my elective classes. Although, you know, I don't know if you've had this or anybody out there has had this, but like you start thinking out the box, especially in this pandemic, you know, you start kind of going, well, I mean, I've always wondered about artist management. Like I could do that. Or like, you know, I'm kind of into A&R and you take these classes and you're exposed to different parts of the business and you're like, I don't know that I would hate doing that. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to be open and not just be like music, music, songwriting, you know, because, you know, I had a great time in the logic class and I learned things that I never thought I'd learn to do. And I kind of dig producing, you know, so, so anything goes, but I just want to learn. I've had a curious nature since I was young and I just, I never want to stop learning. You released an album called Gypsy Moonshine in 2010, and it's kind of bluesy country. Can you talk about your style as a musician and what you would like to do for your potential next album? Yeah. Fun question. I'm in the middle of all of that right now. So uh, Gypsy Moonshine came about because a lot of people were, you know, saying that I should make a record. And I was always very resistant to that because if we go back to the beginning of this podcast, I was just still lugging around some old baggage that was like, nobody wants to hear me sing. Nobody wants to hear me make a record. And everybody around me, like a lot of people in the Broadway community started making records. And it seemed like the next logical thing. But I just was like, I was terrified. So I just passed it off as I don't want to. I don't want to. (laughs) When I was just scared and I totally wanted to. So Finally, uh, I got the nerve to say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I was in love with country music at a very early age, which is odd for a black girl from Orange County, California. Yes, (laughs) I know. I know. Um, But I did love it. And uh, so I was going to make a country record. I was like, I'll just do that. I didn't write music at all. And I was going to have all my friends write songs for me. It seemed like such a great thing. I'll do this record. I'll have my friends write for me, and it'll be a blast. And my producer uh, said, if you're going to do country music, I'm just encouraging you to try to write. 
on your own because there's something about those stories, folk stories, country stories, blues stories that just are more authentic and more true if they come from you. And he said, so that's just my two cent, you know, do with what you want. I was kind of like, okay, I mean, I'll try, but I'm not a good writer. And I I had no real experience with writing at all. So I did. I co-wrote with a lot of people, my friends, and I think it turned out great. Um, Then I was gigging for the first time, which was all very scary. It was the first time that I was really, really on my own. And after that, I said, I'm done. I'm good. I made a record and I don't ever have to write again. And people were like, but you're a songwriter now. And I was like, I'm not a songwriter. I'm a girl who wrote some songs. So I'm done. And then probably like five years after that, every time I listened to that record, I would cringe. I would cringe in a way that I was like, I didn't sound good. Those songs are dumb. I was, you know, it's like the most elementary rhymes, cat with hat. I mean, (laughs) just like bad. But now I listen to it and I think it's perfect. It's perfect for that girl who was terrified. Mm -hmm. I listened to it like I remember her. I remember how scared she was. She didn't know how to write at all. And so there's so much grace when I listen to it like, oh, she didn't hit that note. God bless her. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Like it was a perfect recording of a moment in my life where I really had a breakthrough and saying, I'm terrified to do this. I'm walking through the fear. So I hear it differently now. I, I usually kind of feel a way when I talk to people because that's basically the only music I've put out since when people say, oh, let me look up your stuff or let me see you on Spotify. And then that's what comes up. And I know they're like, huh? And I'm like, you have to know the story, you know, because it. I think when you listen to it with those ears, with what I'm saying now, there's just such grace. And I think there's something so beautiful and innocent about it. Yeah. But I would say five years after that, is when I decided to pick up the pen again. And what was crazy was there was just this blooming moment of me going, I love to sing. I am a singer. I love to write songs. It's all I want to do from about 2015, 2016 on. It's like, that's all I want. I'm a singer and I love it. And I'm never going to shy away from that again. Mm -hmm. You know, I started back writing and I wrote for other people. I wrote with no nothing in mind, just like no genre, not for me, not, it doesn't matter, just write. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what got me back into, to writing. And um, so now I feel like the style, that was more bluesy country. And now I've moved to, I don't know, my influencers are Bill Withers, Aretha Franklin, Michael Kiwanuka, Adele. So like a soulful singer songwriter, maybe. Yeah. I don't know, with like a vintage overtone. It's a great combination. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I am I have a lot of songs written that I haven't recorded. And uh, I'm trying to take the rest of this pandemic time, which feels like it's ticking because I'm like <laughs> closer, things are happening and mm-hmm. I don't have enough time anymore. But yeah, I hope to get at least some of it out soon, especially being at Berkeley because everybody's hustling at Berkeley. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess the nice thing is sometimes that can double as like one of your projects. Yeah, I'm getting some good rights in this lyric writing class. I'm like, okay, that's for the record. That's for the record. That's awesome. <laughs> so something else that you did recently is you did a spoken word track with Forrest Black. Can you talk a bit about the song? Because it has such a powerful message, um, you know, about racial justice. And I'm sure it was written in response to Black Lives Matter. Yeah, I have chills right now. <laughs> Whee. Um, so I uh, was in a in a band called Ghost Towns, which is kind of like another little side gig that I do. <laughs> Our manager had said, "Oh, you got to meet this guy. Uh, he does these spoken words, and I re- I rep him, and you know you should know him." And I listened to a spoken word, and it's actually not what Forrest does. He he's a great singer songwriter who has a song right now. Um, if you loved her, that's like climbing up the charts, mm-hmm. which is so amazing. We met on a Zoom. Like we just like, okay, I was writing with a lot of people during the pandemic, and I'm like, okay, I'll do it. So we got on this Zoom, and I wasn't expecting anything. I didn't know, you know, when you show up for a write, it's like, will we write a song? Will we just talk for five hours? Like what's gonna happen? So we talked for two hours. It might have been two hours or two and a half hours. And I was like, oh, my God, well, this was so great. I guess we've spent all our time and we, we're probably not going to write now, but let's set something up. And he was like, I have all day. And I was like, oh, we're doing it? And he's like, yeah. So I started telling him about, you know, this time that we were in 
when everybody was marching and and we were all kind of standing up for justice and i i had been trying to find my voice in the middle of of all of it you know and and how i wanted so badly to use art to to share my feelings but i just had been coming up short so we just had a conversation about it and you know at some point he started producing right there he's like putting music to it and this and that and the other and then all of a sudden it was a spoken word and i was like well this is cool this is not what i do but I, you know i'm digging what's happening so we finished i think it was probably we started at one o'clock and i think that night we ended up at one o'clock in the morning the first day we ever met each other and we just kind of had the beginnings of this thing and the next day we got on around noon and we stayed on the zoom to like two so i said you know he says i'm just trying to figure out is this for you is this for me is this and i was like well i don't do spoken word but you have those pieces and he's like okay he's like i was kind of thinking maybe it could be a duet and i was like uh, oh, okay, you know, and so then we did it and started putting together, and I mean, we sobbed all weekend because I just thought, isn't it funny that I've been trying to find my way and find my voice and how I want to say this, mm -hmm. and I have this meeting with this white guy yeah. who helps me execute exactly what I've been wanting to say, you know, Yeah. and it ended up being the most important thing that I've written to date. I'm so proud of it and to put it up on Spotify and Insta and have strangers commenting saying this moved me, this is so powerful, what an impact was exactly my intention, you know, yeah. just to move people and make people think. I guess for my final question is it's just such a difficult time in the music industry. What keeps you inspired and just pushing forward creatively? I think this time is special for me because I have time. I fully am aware of everything that's happening in the world, and I am not one to tune out and shut that out, you know? It's like I feel it every day, but what I was saying last year is like, you know, am I healthy? You know, is my family healthy? Are we safe? There's, you know, making time for standing up for justice, making time for being interested in everything that's happening politically, and then using time that I personally have not had for at least a decade, if not more. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of this has just been special for me because I've I didn't have to be inspired to do something. I just, the time was the inspiration, you know, and it became what have I always wanted to do? What have I, you know, and I've never been this home this much with my husband and my dogs, you know, <laughs> I've never been home this much to cook every day, you know, meals. And I don't even love to cook, but just the fact that it's not ordering out or being in a hotel or, you know what I mean? I um, started learning how to play piano, started school, you know, I served on Instagram with a theater from my community with Eden Espinosa, and we did something called Game Night, which mm. was every Thursday, a kind of Broadway trivia, name that tune, Broadway, celebrity, the Broadway version, you know, yeah. and people started coming every Thursday for the hour, and we just did it to make people happy and and kind of get through this dark time, you know? So um, I just wouldn't have the time to even do that, to, to play on Instagram with my best friend for an hour, you know? So I just think it's just offered me what I feel is unique opportunities. You know, I know some would say working with Bette Midler is such a unique opportunity. And I'm like, and it is, but also for me, time is such a unique opportunity. Right. So I'm so grateful. I would never have started school. You know, I would have never had the patience to sit down and really learn an instrument and write. I've been putting off doing my record for a hundred years now. Um, so I'm just grateful for that. You know, as long as everybody's healthy and happy, it did feel like the world was falling apart for a minute there, but we're okay. <laughs> We are okay, aren't we? That's good to hear. You know what else is good? Taking a course with Berkeley Online and having somebody like Camila in your class. 
And because you listen to this podcast, including the credits, you can have $100 off your first Berkeley online course. All you have to do, go to musicismylifepod.com and you'll find all the info you need there. This episode was edited by me and Talia Smith, who was also the person asking the questions. Mastered by Jose David Vindis Mora. All visual assets coordinated by Mike DeBenedictus. Social media by Brooke Larson. Web assistance courtesy of Mark Thomas, Steve Zimmerman, and Joe McDonough. Thanks to our video team who posts these episodes on YouTube two weeks after they premiere on podcast services. I wrote and recorded the Music Is My Life theme song, but the expert remixing comes courtesy of Lily Dickinson. Special thanks to Gabriel Reifer Cohen, Ashley Pointer, and thanks to you for listening. And take note to join us on Monday, April 19th for guests Margot Nahas and Jay Vigon, a couple who designed some of the most iconic album covers of the 1970s and 80s. We're talking Purple Rain, 1984, Metal Health, as well as albums from Tom Petty, Black Sabbath, you name it. Anyway, talk to you then. Stay safe, listeners, and stay inspired.